I want to welcome everybody to today's talk on the filibuster and policy making essential knowledge for social workers or everything you wanted to know about the filibuster but were afraid to ask. Um, that's hosted by the Arizona State University School of Social Work. Um, this is the first of a number of events in ASU's new critical issues series. My name is Liz Lightfoot and I'm the director here at ASU. And the ASE School of Social Work is amongst the largest and most diverse schools of social work in the country. And our faculty and students are committed to social work research and practice that supports the social, cultural, and overall health and well being of the people and communities of the Southwest and recognizes the 22 Native nations that have inhabited the land where ASU currently sits for centuries. So as social work scholars and practitioners in Arizona, we pay a lot of attention to state and federal policy. And many of us have been laser focused on the filibuster, which has been taking center stage in the Senate recently surrounding the efforts to pass voting rights legislation and bills related to the infrastructure package. And many social workers in Arizona and across the country are now calling for filibuster reform. Though others are wondering exactly what is its history or its purpose, or what the pros and cons in the long term are of filibuster reform. And we've been getting a lot of inquiries at ASU about the filibuster. So what we've decided at ASU was to invite one of the top experts in the country on the Senate filibuster, Professor Sarah Binder, who isn't associated with ASU or the field of social work, to give social work students and faculty at ASU and social workers across Arizona and from around the country an independent expert nuts and bolts overview of filibuster and filibuster reform proposals and to answer your questions. And we're really happy that we had about 500 social workers sign up for today's presentation. So let me introduce um, Professor Binder to you. So Sarah is a professor of political science at George Washington University and a senior fellow at Brookings specializing in Congress and legislative politics. Um, she is most recently the co-author with Mark Spindell of The Myth of Independence, How Congress Governs the Federal Reserve, which was awarded a number of um, awards, including the Richard F. Fenno Jr. Prize for Best Book on Legislative Politics and the Gladys Camera Award for Best Book Published on U.S. National Policy. So she's written and conducted a lot of research on Congress and legislative politics. Um, some of her earlier books that seem particularly relevant are Minority Rights and Majority Rule, Partisanship and the Development of Congress, or with Stephen S. Smith, Politics or Principle, Filibustering in the United States Senate. She's published other books, and she's also published a lot in the American Political Science Review and the American Journal of Political Science and elsewhere. Um, she's also an elected member of the American Arts Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she's the political science editor of the Washington Post Monkey Cage blog, which I encourage you all to take a look at or follow. And she's a former co-editor of Legislative Studies Quarterly and a former president of the Midwest Political Science Association. So you can see we brought in pretty much the top expert on the filibuster to talk with us today, and we're really lucky to have her with us. So she will talk for 30 to 40 minutes and then she'll answer your questions. So if you have questions, please type these in the Q&A button and we will get to these afterwards. And this is in the, the webinar format. So um, you're all muted and um, the way to communicate it with us is through the Q&A button. So I will turn it now over to, to um, Professor Binder. Great, excellent. Um, thank you so much uh, for including me uh, today. Um, so my goal, um, as Liz suggested, is to try to help you to understand the origins of the filibuster, its impact on the making of public policy today, and also the mechanics and the prospects uh, for reform. So um, and then, as I say, I'll go maybe 30, 30 40 uh, minutes, and then any questions uh, you might have, and you should never be afraid to ask them uh, about the filibuster, uh, which even I find still sort of confusing. So uh, don't don't be shy uh, about about asking. So um, this, of course, uh, is a uh, snapshot or still from the 1939 uh, Hollywood movie, Mr. Smith um, Goes to Washington. And it, it captures the notion of what many of us have in our head as the filibuster that today, for reasons we'll come to, we now seem to call the talking 
filibuster. So senators go to the floor. They often, under this view or notion of the filibuster, would pull an all-nighter, as it would, as it were, trying to kill or kill a bill or force the majority to compromise to, to change it. Now. Of course, this notion uh, of the talk all night filibuster, it's its not just in Hollywood, uh, at least back in the mid 20th century, we have them uh, in the US, uh, US Senate. Uh, for better or for worse, this is uh, Dick Russell from Georgia on the left and Ev Dirksen from Illinois uh, in the middle of a filibuster. Uh, I've always known that they pull out the cots for the senators. I hadn't realized that they bring their PJs and their house coats <laughs> uh, too, but, but uh, a sight to be seen, uh, there they are. Now, as course, um, these sorts of filibusters, the all out, what we sometimes call a war of attrition, like which is the last team standing uh, over a bill, these don't exist anymore. And for a lot of reasons that we'll come to this afternoon. But to get there, let me just tell you where we're going. First, I want us to spend just a little bit of time on the nuts and bolts of the filibuster, because I think it's important to see how they fit into the sort of daily or the mechanisms of bringing bills up on the Senate floor. Then we want to quickly take a look back to history. Why does the Senate, but today not the House, allow filibusters, which will tell us a little bit more about the origins of the filibuster. Then briefly think about how the filibuster shapes policy outcomes or policy stalemate. And then we can wrap up trying to think about how would you change the rules if you wanted to? What did Democrats just uh, attempt uh, on the Senate floor? What are the options? And then what, of course, are the prospects for, for change? OK, so what exactly is a filibuster? So just generally, I think of it as an effort or efforts to delay or to entirely block a Senate majority from advancing to a vote on the floor. It could be a vote on a bill, a vote on an amendment, a vote on a procedure. You can even filibuster what we call the motion to proceed to a bill, to set the agenda for the Senate. You can That can be filibustered as well. Now in the House, a majority, all it has to do to cut off debate is to use what we call today the previous question motion. If a majority votes for the previous question motion, it cuts off debate and the House advances to a vote. But the Senate, if we're into the nuts and bolts here, the Senate doesn't have a previous question motion. And that means a majority can't, typically, with some exceptions we can come to, it just can't close debate by a majority vote. And that's what we've seen. So the voting rights uh, bill, for example, as we'll come to, they, they couldn't cut off debate. And why? Well, if you don't have a previous question motion, you don't have a rule for cutting off debate by majority vote, leaders have two options. So first, and we often see this, they'll go to the floor and they literally ask for unanimous consent. Is there anybody in this 100 senators, the Senate chamber of prima donnas, do any of you <laughs> object? And sure enough, on any major bill, somebody objects, right? and you don't even need to be on the floor to lodge your objection, the leader, usually the majority leader, sends out a note, used to, used to come on a hotline telephone, now it seems to come by email, here's what we wanna ask for consent, goes to the minority side, goes to the majority side, and any senator, even their staff, often, uh, can tell the leader when the majority leader goes to the floor and asks unanimous consent to move to a vote or to schedule a bill or what have you, I want you to object. And often that's done anonymously. So that means absent 100 senators willing to take a vote or to schedule a vote, this, the Senate leader has to move to route two, which is in today's Senate to seek cloture, which is what I think we've now become more familiar with. And I think we are now have heard enough about the quote unquote, the 60 vote Senate. That's what we mean. The cloture motion, it's a motion for cutting off debate, but for most measures and motions, it requires 60 votes. And as we know, the Senate majority this year is 50-50. Uh, and so 50 is not enough to get to 60. And as we'll see, and as I think is uh, become quite aware, the two parties are often at odds with one another. And so it can be very difficult for either party to attract the number of votes to get up to 60. It, it does happen, and it happens out of 
public eye on, on bills that are probably less salient to us. But also to keep in mind, we don't see a lot of 60 votes just sneaking over the sneaking over the line there. We often see 80 votes for cloture. And that means that both parties have sort of bought into whatever the bill is on the floor. Okay, that's our nuts and bolts here. And so the predicament will be for Senate leaders, how do you get to 60? How do you ever get to 60? And could there be reforms to that 60 vote rule that lower the threshold in some way or alter the threshold in some way? And as we'll see, and you may be thinking uh, in your mind here, senators have changed that 60 vote rule in the past and they've changed it most recently for nominations and also including Supreme Court nominations, which of course is why the news is all about who can uh, President Biden and Senate Democrats get confirmed. And if they all stick together, they don't need 60. They can cut off the vote, vote. they can get cloture with a simple majority. So that's the predicament. No simple majority cutoff rule in the Senate aside for these exceptions that have been carved out. And just one more, just to make the map here, there are other exceptions to that 60 vote rule, and it came quite visible over the debate over the Build Back Better uh, of social policy programs. And we can come to that in Q&A, but that falls under its own little category of budget rules that can't be filibustered. Okay, so we have the nuts and bolts here. It does raise the question though, right, why? Like, why would there be any legislative chamber that allows a minority of the chamber to block, or even a minority of one at times, to block a majority from advancing toward a vote, right? What we're talking about is blocking voting, right? Not blocking necessary packet passage, but just blocking the very act of putting senators on the record, yay or nay, against a proposal. So there's a lot of conventional wisdom out there about why the Senate has this kind of weird place where you need a supermajority to cut off debate. And that conventional wisdom, sometimes we say, well, at, back in 1789, when the framers were setting up the Senate, the Senate was a smaller body, more elite. We have this notion it was supposed to be more deliberative. You know, states were represented not, uh, not proportionally, but there isn't any evidence that any of that is really true. It was smaller and they did see themselves as elitist, um, but the original Senate, as we'll see, really moved by majority, majority rule. So as best I can tell in my version of what happened to generate the ability to filibuster, I really think it was historical accident. So this is what you need to know about the, the origins of the, of the filibuster. And also keep in mind, this will tell us a little bit about how the Senate eventually can change its, change its rules. So both chambers in 1789 had that rule that I talked about that the House uses today, the previous question motion. So if we looked in the House rules that were written in 1789, if you look in the Senate rules that are written in 1789, they both have this kind of procedural mumbo jumbo that we now really referred to as the previous question motion. But neither version of that rule worked the way it does today. Remembering in the House, they use it for a majority to cut off debate. Back in 1789, they were really still experimenting. They didn't have a committee system. They didn't have party leaders. Uh, they had you know, Alexander Hamilton the guy from the musical, right? He, he was in Treasury Department, and yet he was intricately involved in trying to manage uh, manage Congress. So the, the place looked quite different. And if anything, when that rule was used in either chamber, it was used to postpone a vote to actually keep debate going, which is, it's kind of crazy pants because it's the exact opposite of how it's used today. But that becomes pretty important. So this is 1789. By 1805, we have the vice president, uh, Aaron Burr, also from the musical. Uh, Aaron Burr is the vice president. He, that makes him the presiding officer of the Senate. And Aaron Burr has just uh, 
about a year ago uh, or so murdered uh, Alexander Hamilton, but he's He's still the presiding officer of the Senate. They don't seem to mind. He gives a farewell speech to the Senate and he says a number of things. Now, how do we know what he says? We don't have a verbatim transcript, but luckily we have John Quincy Adams who was then in the house and he kept a diary. This is like not the most exciting diary unless you're a student of Congress. <laughs> but if you go into the diary, he was a pleasant fellow, uh, he tells us what Aaron Burr was talking about on the floor in his departure speech. And what Burr was doing was he's basically telling the Senate, you are this great deliberative body, but your rule book could be cleaner. And he begins to single out a bunch of rules that could be changed. And at the very bottom there, he says, he mentioned one or two of the rules which appeared to him to need a revisal, uh, recommended the abolition of that of the previous question, which he had said in the last four years had only been used once and that was on an amendment. And that was proof it couldn't be that necessary. And its purposes were better used by the question of indefinite postponement. What does that mean? He says, look, you're using this motion to postpone debate. You have a motion to postpone. You don't need another one. So you really should get rid of the previous question motion. And in 1806, the next year, they cleaned up their rule book. And you look at the rules before and after. And the previous question motion is gone. Now all fine and good, they weren't using it to cut off debate. But in the House, by 1811, 1811, they are gearing up to the, well, they didn't call it the War of 1812 then, but we do now. They're gearing up the War of 1812. And the, basically, the majority realizes they need to cut off debate. There's filibustering going on. They reinterpret. They give the previous question a new meaning. And essentially, they turn it into roughly today's cloture motion, today's majority vote, right? A majority vote to cut off debate. And the House is off and running. And they use that previous question motion to end filibusters of all sorts of other rules changes so that by a hundred years later, the House looks like this majoritarian institution. In the Senate, uh, not so lucky because when partisanship heats up 1830s, when slavery uh, and abolition come on the agenda and we get into and out of the Civil War, there's filibusters, right? Not because the great senators of the 19th century loved debate, but because they got rid of, or at least partially because they got rid of the previous question motion. So you end up in a chamber in the Senate where every time there was a filibuster, you know, sometimes they lived with it. Sometimes they went sort of went to battle on the floor. And other times really there was this norm. At the end of the day, they're gonna take a vote. And when filibustering got out of hand, party leaders in the Senate tried to reinstate the new, they looked over to the house and said, hey, that's a good rule, we need that over here. And they tried to put it back in the rules. And you might imagine when that goes a bit, try back, back in the rules, it just gets filibustered. And so it takes until 1917, the build up to World War I, we didn't call it that then either, <laughs> uh, but in the heat of World War I and an intense filibuster and the involvement of the president, Woodrow Wilson at the time, the Senate creates the cloture rule. So the cloture rule we talk about today gets created in 1917. It has a higher hurdle, it's 67 votes. And again, down in the 70s, they moved it down to 60. So 60 isn't uh, magic. It's not historically uh, important. It's just lower than 67. And 67 was a compromise in the first place as well. Okay. so. That gives us sort of roughly, and we can come back to so sort of the historical changes that got us to the 60 vote version, but it essentially sets up the contemporary Congress for us today, which raises the question, okay, you don't have a previous question motion. You need to get 60 or unanimous, which is very tough. So what does that mean in practice for what happens to bills uh, on the floor or in anticipation of bills going to the floor? So, and this is my really bad uh, chart art, text art here. Um, if we imagine the Senate in a, what we think of as a less polarized world, that is we could imagine all the, so the ideologies would go from liberal senators, say Elizabeth Warren to moderates, we'll call them, we could call them Cinema, uh, Senator Cinema or Senator uh, Collins, the conservatives, the Rand Pauls and the Ted Cruz's on the right. And then just a bell-shaped curve. And if we lived in a world with a lot of moderates, very few liberals, very few conservatives, right? If a, 
if the majority put a bill on the floor, well, the changes you need to attract the vote of the 60th senator, if we lived in this world of just this one left-right dimension, right? Your party wants $25 billion. My party wants $75 billion. Um, let's compromise because we need 60. Well, you wouldn't have to change, right? You might go maybe uh, $30 billion, right? You might just slightly actually moderate your bill to attract the vote of the 60th senator. Now, in a world like that, we might say the filibuster promotes bipartisanship and more moderation. We might say that, but of course, for those of you thinking about the Senate and Congress today, right, that's not what the Senate looks like, right? Today, we talk about a, a polarized Senate. So now we want to think about what is it, ha what happens when you need to attract the vote of the 60th senator in a polarized world, right? Or a bipolar world. Um, many liberals on the left many conservatives on the right, and really pretty lonely in the middle. Well, we can think about, right, we'll put Elizabeth Warren uh, for just uh, emblematic of the Democratic left here in the Senate. Uh, no surprise, we put, uh, he's grown a beard, but uh, beardless Ted Cruz uh, on the right. And then you can guess where I am going in the 50th senator. We often point uh, to Joe Manchin from West Virginia. I probably would put call these folks put the cinnamon here. Uh, sometimes we say in an ideological sense, maybe Mansions uh, Cinema's forty nine and Mansions fifty, but and we don't need to fuss with that. The reality is each of them, as we've seen, uh, have have at times uh, insisted on something for their for their vote. So, if you just needed the fifty senators and maybe if your party was larger than 50, you might probably be able to come up with a compromise. But as we know, you need vote, um, oh, we should always have the president here. I'm putting him, we'll put him slightly to the left on uh, most issues here. And then the 60th senator. And the crazy part about the 60th senator, when we look at people's voting scores and we kind of figure out like who's in that spot, no one knows who this guy is. I think that Senator Rounds uh, from South Dakota, um, He's not the prominent, right? He's not the person who's out, out to get his vote. It's really all about Mitch McConnell as representative of the Republican Party, which just points us to think it's not so easy anymore to attract the vote of the 16th senator. And as I said, often we don't get 60 votes for cloture. We might get 70 or further into the Republican Party joining the Democrats. But you can see the challenge here, right? the more you need to do to attract the vote of the 60th senator, well, that's a pretty big distance compared to our less polarized Senate, where you just had to do a little bit of, a little bit over, a little bit less or a little bit more to attract the 60th vote. But now you might make changes to attract uh, Senator Rounds' vote, but then you risk losing Elizabeth Warren's vote. And sure, well, maybe you could do that with 60, right? grab a few more Republicans, but as a Democratic Party, you might in fact want uh, to have a policy that Elizabeth Warren and uh, supporters of her within the Democratic Party uh, can support. So you have a party that's squeezed here, largely by the alignment of views, but also by differences within the Democrat, in this case, the Democratic Party, as well as differences on, on the Republican Party side. Now, uh, where how should we think about this, one way to, to move here is just to, ex let's just extract a little bit uh, from this particular scenario. I want us to think generally about what the Senate looks like, and then we can think about uh, what it would take to reform the 60, uh, 60 vote rule. Um, just an aside here, while we're, because I know you probably have questions possibly about reconciliation and the Build Back Better plan. That we, we basically ban the filibuster under budget law, federal budget law. And so all the action is on uh, from the 50th, so from Cinemansion uh, down uh, to Senator Warren, right? And for reasons we can come to why Republicans have no interest in joining, joining in. And so it's just a reminder here that even in the absence of the filibuster, like 
building coalitions in today's Senate is difficult. It's very hard, especially uh, especially when uh, Senator Manchin is quite a bit distinct coming from such a red state uh, as, as his colleagues. So we just want to be a little careful. We don't want to think that the filibuster is the, is the only cause of what often appears to me as dysfunction in the Senate, but it's certainly central. And it's, as we'll see, it's, it's central because this is, it's integral to the ability of leaders to put bills on the floor if you need 60 votes even, uh, even to do that. Okay, so one thing I just think it's helpful to keep in mind here, this is um, a measure of what we call partisan polarization. And we could come back to how we build it, but it's basically built from roll call votes in every chamber, in every Congress, back uh, to the late, late 19th century. And what we can do basically is the same thing we did in the last slide is based on the roll call votes, we can pretty much line up senators and it tells us a fair amount about where they end up voting um, from the far left to the middle to the far right. And once we do that, we can figure out where's the middle of the Democratic Party, where's the middle of the Republicans and what's the distance. And so as you go up the X, the Y axis, that's the distance between the parties. And so from today's, if you look at the House and Senate, both are all really from this measure historically polarized, right? But also to keep in mind, this isn't the first time in history we've had parties uh, so at odds with one another if we look back 100, 100 years or so. Now, I think it's important to just ask ourselves, because I think it will help us think about reforms, like what's captured by this measure? Like, are, like we call it partisan polarization and we have in mind this ideological disagreement, but the parties disagree on issues with no ideological content, right? What we really mean sort of role of government. Should there be um, like how strong a role should the government play in subsidizing or making childcare affordable? A, a strong role, we call that sort of liberal or more constrained, say market oriented role where the federal government doesn't weigh in, right? And that's how we interpret this graph. Today, we're at odds that the parties are so ideologically polarized. But the polarization here, right? It goes way beyond ideological issues. In fact, we could just call it partisan team play. Your team's for it, so my team is against it. Even though in the past, my team might have been for it <laughs> when your team was against it. So um, the, the individual mandate in the Affordable Care Act, Republicans were for it when it was uh, Romney Care in Massachusetts with Republicans, but they become against it when it's embraced by Democrats. Um, January 6th commission, Democrats embraced it, Republicans were opposed to it. That wasn't ideological. Voting rights, that's probably both partisan and ideological, but you get the, the sense here. You can have disagreements on issues reg right, regardless of the content of the issue. And that's another reason why it's so hard to get to 60, right? Because it's not necessarily the tweaking of the bills, it's whether or not the opposition party wants to go to the bargaining table with you in the first place which their party base might not be that pleased about. Okay, happy to come back to that. So why are the rules so hard to change then and what options are on the table? So there are what I think of as two pathways to reform. For, we'll just call them today here, follow the rules or bend the rules. Uh, if you listen to the debate on uh, voting rights and the Democrats discussions and efforts to re basically a carve out an exception to the filibuster, we'll see that that's going to fall under bend the rules. If you were listening to the debate, you would have heard uh, Mitch McConnell as the Republican leader and many Republicans call it break the rules. Now, we can come to whether it's breaking or not. I really think it's bending, not breaking, but just to put in context what you might have what you might have heard. So follow the rules. How would that work? Well, this is the hardest because if you look at that cloture rule that requires 60 votes to cut off debate, there's a different clause in the rule for cutting off debate on proposals to change the rules. That requires a two-thirds vote or 
roughly, so at 67 votes of senators present and voting. So obviously then an even higher threshold. And if you can't get 60 to cut off debate, the chances of getting 67 to cut off the filibuster of a rules change, right? That's why we don't really hear about lawmakers pursuing reform by following the rules. Although if you listen carefully to what both less so Senator, uh, Senator Sinema, but more so Senator Manchin, who's not ruled out filibuster reform, some it goes back and forth, uh, but he wants the Senate, if they're going to do it, he wants it done in a bipartisan way, which is follow the rules, cut off debate with a two thirds vote, move to a vote on, on your rules reform, uh, and then the rules get changed. So what do you do without 67, let alone 60? And we know there's, you've probably possibly heard about the nuclear option or nuking parts of the filibuster. That's all in the second category. That's what we call bend the rules. So what do we really mean? This gets even in deeper into, uh, I might call it, send, it's not Senate fantasy land, but it's just like so weird that it's hard to wrap our head around. If you're on the Senate floor, a majority of the Senate can vote to create a new precedent. So we know that courts have precedents, so decisions they've made in the past that sometimes they try to adhere to. The Senate has a huge compendium, right? 200 plus years of precedents. What does it really mean? Precedents are interpretations of the rules because the rules can't tell you how they apply in every single circumstance, right? During a filibuster, can you drink water? Maybe. Can you drink milk? Well, it, the, the rule doesn't tell us. And so majorities have had to reach these decisions over time. And so a majority can vote to create a new precedent, a new interpretation of the cloture rule. And that's what's been termed the nuclear option. So just an example, and then we, I think it'll help explain why we call it nuclear. So in 2013, Democrats were frustrated with Republican obstruction of executive and lower court judicial nominations. And they basically did a nuclear move. They took the cloture rule and in a series of parliamentary steps, they created a new precedent, a new interpretation. They interpreted the cloture rule, not to say 60, they interpreted it <laughs> to mean a majority, a simple majority when dealing with nominations. If you look at the text of the rule today, it hasn't changed. The formal, what we call the standing rule, the Senate requires 60 votes to cut off debate on nominations, but Senate Democrats created a new interpretation, a new precedent in 2013 to reinterpret 60 to simple majority, right? Republicans thought, hmm, that's a good trick. We're going to do it too. They did it in 2017 to apply to, to reinterpret the rule to apply the simple majority cloture to Supreme Court nominees. Now, that's not unprecedented as it were. Leaders throughout Senate history have pushed for these, what we sometimes call reform by ruling. Let's let a majority reinterpret the rule. That's been done quite a bit. What was novel about the 2013 Democratic move and the 2017 Republican move is majorities had not reinterpreted the, the threshold of cloture. They sort of fooled around with other L parts of Senate rules and roughly other parts of cloture, but not the cloture threshold itself. And that's why opponents have called it nuclear, right? It's, it's as if you're throwing a bomb into the, the Senate and taking away the rights of majority simply by majority rule, by majority vote, even though the follow the rule path would say you can't do that. But majorities can create precedents and that's why I think of it as bending the rules, not breaking the rules. Okay, and of course, the version that we saw just a couple of weeks ago uh, was Democrats trying to carve out an exception for this particular voting rights measure. And it had a couple of nuances to it. They, at the end of the day, they wanted to nuke the rules in order to come up with this sort of special procedure 
that at the end of the day would have allowed a majority eventually to cut off debate on the voting rights measure. And as we know, uh, Democrats failed to get all 50 of them. Senator Harris, vice president, uh, was waiting in the wings. I think they all knew they weren't going to get to 50, but if they got to 50 and it was 50-50, they could have then uh, had the vice president break, break the tie. Okay, so reform proposals, there are a lot of them, and I've, I realize I've only put a, a couple of them on here and we can talk and entertain um, other ones. Now, these could in some world uh, be done by the follow the rules path. And some of them have more or less um, inkling of support from Republicans. Nobody expects Democrats to use the follow the rules path because they don't think there's that level of support. So these would have to be done through the nuclear path, but Senator Sinema and Manchin have ruled that out. So what we're really talking about here is options for a future Democratic or a future Republican majority that might find their sort of path to a bill so blocked that bill might be so important to them that they might be willing to either carve out an exception or nuke the filibuster altogether. So what do these proposals include? First, some version of lowering the cloture threshold below 60 votes. So that's certainly in the realm of possibility. And there's a whole range of ideas on how you might lower it uh, below 60. Um, way back when, uh, 25 years ago, when uh, Steve Smith and I wrote our book about the filibuster, we had the idea, well, maybe it should ratchet down slowly to simple majority. So you could have any type of sort of delay built in, but you could start for 60. If you don't get 60, go down to 57, maybe a couple days or a week even, go down to 54. That doesn't work, go down to 51. So eventually, right, the minority, the opposition would have the, the opportunity to make its case to try to change minds, but at the end of the day, it would be a majority cutting off debate. Other ideas today carve out exceptions to the legislative filibuster. So some version of what Democrats have heartily attempted on the voting rights carve out, right? Um, some version of it they sort of did on uh, raising the nation's debt limit. It was a little bit different the way they did that. Um, but there, so there's a whole bunch of different um, versions that might fall under this idea that we're not going to ban legislative filibusters altogether, but we're going to take a piece or two out. Uh, Senator Manchin said, you know, that's like uh, carving the turkey and saying, I'm just going to have a piece. He said, you know, you're going to eat the whole thing. At the end of Thanksgiving, there's nothing left. So the danger, of course, as we can come to, is you carve out part, uh, and that just makes it easier for the next majority to cut out even more, uh, leaving potentially your party worse off uh, than before. Um, there's also efforts sometimes to ban certain types of procedural filibusters. Uh, we don't need to go the nuts and bolts there, but rather than just thinking about filibusters of bills and amendments, there's still a fair amount of procedures which are debatable. So there's ideas to ban filibusters of those motions. And generally, there's an idea that perhaps we should shift the burden to the minority party. So think about how the cloture rule uh, works today. You have to get to 60. The burden is on the majority party to produce 60. So if the final vote were, say, 58, but the, the opposition, you know, let's say they didn't want to be in town that day or they're too busy uh, and they only muster 20 votes against cloture, it doesn't matter under the rule. The burden is on the majority to hit 60. So some people have proposed, well, let's flip the burden rather than producing 60 to end debate or to invoke cloture, why don't we change the requirement to produce 41 votes to block cloture, right? So the minority, the opposition, would actually have to show up, muster all their votes if they really wanted to block the majority from going forward. Now, just one thing to keep in mind, uh, if you look at cloture votes where the majority has failed to get to 60, over the last decade, 
almost every time the minority shows up and delivers over 41 votes. So they're already there. Uh, so it's not, it seems like sort of logically a sort of a creative idea, but I don't think it would have the intended effect because I think they're already in a world where the minority is happy to show up. It's relatively easy to show up to cast a vote um, against cloture. That's why some people raise the other one, which is to force what we think of as a talking filibuster, right? Bring back uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And we can get into the, the politics here, but it's not quite as easy as it sounds, right? We're envisioning that both parties, um, again, this idea of a war of attrition, which is gonna be the last team standing? Well, you could imagine, regardless of which party is in the majority, that the minority might appreciate and champion and enjoy the opportunity to go on record and to raise money off it. For those of you who remember the uh, Rand Paul sort of staged a quasi filibuster a few years ago and the hashtag was stand with Rand and he raised millions of dollars. So you can imagine that the minority party might be fully willing to just have at it. The majority party, well, they have other things on their agenda and they might decide, which I think they've sort of decided with voting rights in some form, they might decide that it's not worth the rest of their agenda sacrificing it and not making progress on these other issues. Because if talking filibuster takes up time, those civil rights filibusters went for not just for days, they went for weeks and often months. So it's just not clear. And also think about the minorities doesn't have to talk. They can look around the chamber in their house coats at three in the morning and hey, there's not a majority here. They can call for a quorum. And then it's the majority who has to show up at three in the morning to produce all the votes for a quorum because otherwise the House has, the Senate has to adjourn. And lest I remind you, this is not a young Senate. <laughs> many, I don't know how many really want weeks on end to be trying to produce a quorum in the middle of the night. So neither party here, but especially the majority really wants to spend the time in a talking filibuster. And also of course, you don't know the outcome of the talking filibuster and you don't know the outcome that could take a little while to get to the outcome versus just filing a cloture motion. That's pretty easy. It's scheduled, we know the time, it's predictable, and more or less they know the outcome. And you could imagine in today's Senate with big things on the agenda, a lot of money to raise, a lot of conflicting demands, senators like to get out of town at the end of the week, just like the rest of us. Um, it is not a lot of appetite within the majority party for turning back the clock here and engaging these sorts of talking filibusters. Okay. Um, I think that might be, that's what I, um, that's what I have. So I'm happy to take um, any questions, any from whatever you have. Okay, so we had some, we had questions that were um, submitted ahead of time and then people have been um, asking questions during your talk. So I'll, I'll sort of feed them to you and, um, and you can see. So we had, we had a number of questions that were um, sort of looking at it, whether there was any benefits at all to the filibuster. Are there any be benefits to the filibuster? Because it, it seems like maybe there aren't. And then sort of related questions to um, what if the GOP holds the power under absence of filibuster, wouldn't existing federal laws such as the Affordable Care Act or Medicaid be threatened? So if we got rid of the fi filibuster, um, would, what are the dangers of this? Sure. So those are great, great questions. So first, there there are clearly benefits to the filibuster. And one way to see that is to remember that the, the, the filibuster exists because of the lack of these debate limits. And so when we think of filibuster, we want to move ourselves away from just the cloture vote, right? We want to think about the other route, which is that leaders are always asking for unanimous consent. And if there was a majority, if there was no filibuster and there was majority rule, just like in the House, individual senators would much less likely have the opportunity to object because leaders really wouldn't need unanimous consent. They might still use it, but they really wouldn't, they didn't, they wouldn't need unanimous consent to schedule the chamber or to make a change in plans. And that hurts the power of individual senators, regardless of whether they're in the majority or the minority. Again, because our parties are not monolithic, they have differences of opinion within, within their party caucuses. 
And so you can imagine a one member, um, and it doesn't have to be a mansion. It can be an, another member who cares, let's say, uh, on the left, who cares deeply about a particular version of climate change. Uh, and they may say, hmm, the Senate is working on a, a bill on, on tax rebates about some other issue. Well, I'm going to object until they pay attention to my bill. So it's a source of leverage for individual senators. And I think many of them deep down are reluctant to give that up. So, and one might also say that we do see policies secure by large bipartisan majorities in the Senate. And they're doing that um, because they need 60 votes for cloture. And so some issues do lend themselves or the politics of some issues lend themselves to decent outcomes. I think the inf infrastructure bill is probably a good example. It, it really isn't ideological. There are common needs there, and senators were able to engineer a process whereby they came to an agreement. Even, I mean, it seems like ancient history, a decade ago, the Senate, in a bipartisan move, passed comprehensive immigration reform, right? Championed, of course, at the time uh, by John McCain. Right? They're able to come to consensus, and they had to because of the rule. So, just to keep in mind, right? What is that rule doing? It's encouraging the parties to go to the table, and that might be valuable. If you can get the parties to go to the table, they don't have to agree like on the ideological sweet spot. They can each get their most preferred outcomes and put into the bill. So something like immigration would work that way. So there's definitely benefits individually and party wise um, to uh, to the filibuster, which has made it all the harder, I think, to change it. What about if the if the Chairs were tables were flipped, chairs were flipped. I never know which one it is. Um, but if Republicans next time they have unified party control and would if they they have an incentive to change the rules, should that worry Democrats, right? Does it put at risk sort of foundational laws that have endured um, certainly Affordable Care Act, um, but also right, Medicare, Medicaid, and so forth? So there's certainly a risk here, right? And we know from watching the 2017 that Republicans were willing to pursue some rather politically and unpopular measures to repeal the Affordable Care Act without anything to replace it. So on the one hand, I'd say, look, just because a Senate Republican majority wants to pursue uh, a, a repeal measure, there isn't necessarily broader policy, public, broader public support for that. Does that reign in Republicans? We don't know. But it's easy to claim you want to do something if you know it's not going to happen because of the filibuster rule, right? So Republicans have talked for some time not Trump did not, but other Republicans talked a lot about sort of pairing back entitlements, sort of sort of changing the future of Medicare and Social Security. But that's easy to propose if you know it's never going to get 60. So the question is, if Republicans were living in a world where suddenly they could be held accountable by voters for failing, <laughs> right, failing to enact their agenda, say affordable care repeal, are they worse off by repealing the filibuster? So I, th I think what that means is often people say, look, if you repeal the filibuster, you have the House and Senate look just alike. Well, the House and Senate have still have some differences. It's baked into the Constitution, broader electorates, staggered elections. Some will never be on the ballot with the president. Now, I might be naive, but I tend to think that's going to restrain some of the enthusiasm on both sides for pairing back, pairing back the filibuster. So we, we had um, a couple of questions that were sort of, you know, focusing on the, the rules of the game or, you know, and how frustrating that was and that the rules seem designed to make legislation into a game rather than actually doing anything constructive. Um, do you think we can update our system to somehow make legislation more effective? The, policy making process, I guess, more effective? Or is this delay part of the process? 
So it's a good, it's a good question. And it's, it's certainly in the, I was trying to say like in the house, do we think less, like do the rules take on uh, more or less prominence? Well, they're little, I would say less so because the majority isn't upended uh, by an intense minority, but procedures in the house do get a lot of heat uh, when the majority flexes their will and get sort of attacked sometimes uh, for being to an aggressive majority. Is there a way to disentangle sort of uh, the less salience on the rules, the game and the Senate? Um, I just think that's really, really hard to do. And the, the players understand that the rules allocate advantages. And so especially in a period of this intense electoral competition where control the chamber, control of government for your party is possibly just around the corner, no surprise that both parties try to exploit the rules that they have, right? Majorities exploit reconciliation. They try to push it as far as they can because it can't be filibustered. And, and the minority uses the filibuster as far as they can uh, in order to not go to the bargaining table and to hold on, right? Have an issue rather than a bill and wait until your party um, recaptures control. So I, I just think it's very, very hard to disentangle the rules from the outcomes. And the other thing to just to keep in mind, I would say 25 years ago, there was much less coverage of the rules of the game, right? And it, I think the media has changed um, the 24 seven nature here. If you looked at my Twitter feed, there's just like all these Hill reporters who've gotten very, very good at understanding the rules and it becomes central to their, their reporting. Um, so I just think it's hard it's hard to get the focus back uh, on on uh, on the substance, although it would be a, a, a good recommendation uh, to the majority to find a way to stay focused on the policies. So, so we also had um, um, a several questions about our, the current um, Democratic senators in the middle who are opposing filibuster reform and what are your views about this? Do you think this is going to hurt them when they go up for re-election? Um, um, your views about politicians in swing states making this move? Um, so I think the mansion, well, first, just to sort of set the, the table. So there are 50 Democratic senators. And they got 40, Democrats got 48 to vote for this carve out on voting rights. And voting rights is a pretty sort of existential issue uh, perceived by the Democrats, important to elements of the party base uh, and to senators themselves and to the prospects of uh, winning presidential elections and Senate elections. So they got 48 and included in those 48 was Mark Kelly, obviously of uh, Arizona, also, John Tester, um, you know, also very red, deep red, almost, if not more, by a point or two, uh, redder than uh, West Virginia, uh, or at least the same. Um, Chris Coons from Delaware, who's seen as a moderate, Tim Kaine uh, from Virginia. And so they got the moderates on board. And as recently as a couple of years ago, moderates had not been on board uh, for banning, sort of any versions of banning, banning the filibuster. So Democrats got farther. Now maybe they got that far uh, because they knew it was going to was going to work. But senators now, like Mark Kelly, have gone on gone on the record of supporting um, carve outs for voting rights. So uh, would they have? Ha are, are these senators making calculations about whether or not voters are going to approve or disapprove? I, I suspect at the end of the day that these rules questions just they do, they motivate in intense activists, right? They intense people who have very strong policy views and want to see the Senate achieve them. But I don't think in most elections, maybe, you know, determined by turnout, but most elections aren't really necessarily one at the edges. They're, especially on the purple state, they're one in the middle or sort of center, center left or center right. I don't know that these procedural issues really uh, rise to the fore. I think these are much more either just general, you're motivated by your partisanship, sort of partisan team play, or you're reacting to the performance of the party, uh, especially in a midterm election. So um, 
I guess I would def defer to all of you about the degree to which um, cinema Senator Cinema's stance on the filibuster is, is that likely um, to be motivating. My guess is it's it's be part the pressures on her in a primary or to generate a, a quality primary challenger would be from a whole basket of issues on her positions uh, on the on the build back better. Um, so and, and Joe Manchin's in a in a world <laughs> in a world of his own. And uh, I don't think I think if anything, it strengthens his reputation as you know, I don't really think of his him in ideological terms. I don't think that really quite captures his distinct role in, in West Virginia. And so I don't think the rules necessarily um, come to the fore in, in those types of those types of races. Um, I, I, I did see there was a there are all these other disputes uh, about the parliamentarian of the Senate and the role she has uh, played in pursuing or blocking really some of these or being a hurdle to some of these democratic like minimum wage uh, proposal and immigration proposals. Uh, I did see there's a protest on the Golden Gate Bridge uh, in, in San Francisco, the big sign that said abolish or like um, fire the parliamentarian. It's like, on the one hand, yeah, the, the, I've never in my life imagined seeing a protest against the Senate, <laughs> the unelected, uh, an otherwise anonymous Senate parliamentarian. Um, but I don't think, I think that's kind of a niche, uh, a niche protest if, as best I can tell. You know, I want to ask you one final question, and that is that we, we hear a lot about how the filibuster is a vestige of Jim Crow and a racist construct. Is that true? And how does that influence um, the use of the filibuster? So the, the filibuster was not born of racial conflict, as we've seen, if, any, if anything, it was like this his, historical accident or unanticipated consequence of a cleaning of the, of the rule book. But its history is deeply entwined with racial questions, both on questions of segregation uh, and the, the conflicts on statehood and so forth, uh, border, borders, uh, territories, admissions of the states, right, before and after the Civil War, and then the whole history of 20th century filibusters on civil rights. What's important to know, though, that's not the exclusive use of filibusters. In the 20th century, there was like a, a political decision by Southerners to concentrate their filibusters on civil rights. And liberals didn't want to use the filibuster lest they right, lose the upper, the moral high ground in attacking segregationist filibusters. So we can't disentangle the history from these racial issues. But it's not the only issue, right? Plenty of partisan issues, spending issues, a whole range of issues, especially the end of the 19th century, and even especially today. Um, at best, from our data back way back when um, Steve Smith and I came up with maybe like a quarter uh, of across a broad span of Senate history being civil rights filibusters. So we can't write the history of the filibuster without recognizing uh, the use of an exploitation of the filibuster by Southern segregationists, um, but that's not the entire history, let alone the origins of the filibuster. Thank you. I think we could probably talk about this for another few hours and <laughs> try to learn more, but I think we probably um, have, have to wrap up now. So I really wanna thank um, Professor Sarah Binder for giving us such a great and detailed overview of the filibuster and for and thank you all of you for coming. Um, our next event in our um, ASU's critical issues series will we'll be hosting the Honorable Angela Robinson who's a national expert on critical race theory who will give a presentation introducing critical race theory to social workers on March 23rd. Um, we're also hosting a national talk on voting rights and social work, which we'll announce soon, which will be um, later on in um, into March or early April. And so we look forward to all of you um, joining us in future events. So thanks so much for coming and, and thanks, Sarah. Sure, thanks so much for having me and for all your excellent questions.